It's a strange concept, but it's been with us for centuries. A small human figure, seemingly brought to life by mysterious means. For many of us, the idea of an inanimate thing suddenly walking and talking is the stuff of nightmares, especially if that thing looks human. Motion pictures now tap into that ancient fear, showing us puppeteers and ventriloquists exchanging personalities, or dolls and dummies brought to life by malicious supernatural forces. But as frighteningly real as some of those stories may seem, puppeteers and ventriloquists are still just entertainers, as they've been for centuries. They don't pose a threat in reality. Most of them, anyway. Over the years, there have been a handful of terrifying cases involving puppet performers with not-so-friendly intentions. Take, for example, the true story of Ronald William Brown from Largo, Florida, formerly a puppeteer on a children's program called Joy Junction. Whether kids actually enjoyed this show is debatable, but Brown's own ideas about kids were horrifying and ultimately led to his arrest, trial, and imprisonment in 2013. Brown was not only a minor TV personality, but a respected member of the community, trusted to transport and supervise children at his local church. But that all changed when his monstrous impulses came to light. A police sting operation eventually linked Brown and an online acquaintance named Michael Arnett to a private web forum whose members shared graphic stories and images of young children being killed, cooked, and eaten. At one time, this virtual club may have had more than 40 known members, and despite the arrests of Brown, Arnett, and several others, it's believed the group has relocated on the deep web, where members' identities are almost impossible to trace. This video, shot the following year in New York, shows an unrelated but bizarre incident involving a street performer charged with public endangerment during one of his disturbing puppet shows. Similar headlines and videos have been circulating online recently, all mentioning puppeteers whose creations have frightened or even injured spectators who dared get too close. Though very unsettling, most of these cases have some kind of explanation for the performer's deeds but there are still a few ominous real-life puppeteer mysteries that remain unsolved. One of these dates back more than a century to famous magician and ventriloquist Will B. Wood, who was so popular he toured the world to sold-out venues. Wood was on one of these tours in 1908 when his ship disappeared in the Gulf of Mexico, along with him, his daughter Bertha, and several trunks of stage equipment. Foul play was suspected, but a federal investigation was inconclusive. Oddly enough, some of Wood's magical gear finally washed ashore, and four of his dummies are now on display at the Vent Haven Museum in Kentucky. Along with these figures, a promotional photo of Wood was also recovered, captioned with the words, El Verdadero Diablo, the true devil. The bodies of Will and Bertha Wood were never found, but that's not the end of the story. Rumors have begun to circulate that Wood's spirit may be inhabiting one or more of his remaining dummies. On three separate occasions, patrons at Vent Haven reported hearing a whispered voice from the room housing Wood's rescued figures. One of these guests claimed to have distinctly heard a man's voice calling, Bertha. The most recent, and perhaps the most chilling, of these unsolved cases involves Alexander Imilov, a Bulgarian artist who moved to Seattle in the early 90s. Imilov had developed a reputation for making grotesque puppets and marionettes, and his street performances frequently incited outrage from parents whose children were terrified of his creations. In April 2016, Imilov announced he would be staging another of these infamous street shows. Records indicate he filed for and received permission to set up his stage in a public park. On the day of the show, a large crowd assembled around the stage and the curtain rose at the scheduled time. However, the puppets which emerged were different from Imilov's usual designs. Some observers claimed they seemed almost lifelike. One witness even claimed to see small wounds on some of the marionettes at points where the strings were attached. Stranger still, about 20 minutes into the show, the puppets suddenly toppled over as if they had simply dropped dead. At first, the audience assumed this was part of the already strange show, but after another 10 minutes passed, they became increasingly confused. According to a local newscast, two young kids eventually snuck behind the stage to see what had happened and were horrified by what they found there. Emiloff himself was nowhere to be found, and apparently no one saw him exit the area. But the two young witnesses told police they could see parts of people in crates behind the curtains. Due to their young ages, the witnesses' names have not yet been released to the public, 
and police are unable to corroborate their testimony since the alleged crates were not present when officers reached the scene. Even a search of Emiloff's apartment produced zero leads. The owner of the property said Emiloff had vacated his small one-bedroom unit two months earlier, leaving nothing behind. It's one of the most terrifying scenarios you can face. The realization that you're not safe in your own home, that someone's watching you, someone unknown and unseen. That's the real life horror at the heart of this story. It's the tale of a suburban home, a terrorized family, and an unidentified presence watching their every move. It began in the summer of 2014, when Derek and Maria Broadus bought this house at 657 Boulevard in the cozy community of Westfield, New Jersey. One evening, while making renovations, Derek received a letter addressed to the new owner. There was no return address. Inside was a typewritten message. Allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood, it began. The letter quickly turned threatening, as the author claimed the property belonged to their family, dating back three generations. They also knew details about the renovations and of the Broadus family themselves, including their three young children. That led to the most frightening passage of all, a request to fill the house with young blood. The letter was signed, The Watcher. So began the Broadus family's never-ending nightmare. After police were informed, Derek and Maria emailed John and Andrea Woods, from whom they had bought the house. They referred to part of the letter claiming the Woods had sold the house at the Watcher's request. It was then they discovered the Woods had received at least one letter from the Watcher themselves. More letters came, this time addressing Broadus family members by name, revealing unnerving details about the children, and referring to something within the walls that would soon make itself known. Will the young blood play in the basement? The Watcher asked. I would be very afraid if I were them. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Authorities suspected the author knew details about the interior of the house only available to someone who could see inside, or who had actually been inside. Police interviewed the Langford family who lived next door and briefly considered Michael Langford, a diagnosed schizophrenic, to be a chief suspect, but found no proof connecting Michael to the letters. By now, the Broadus family's sanity was unraveling and they hadn't even moved in yet. They had been staying with Maria's family throughout the ordeal and were too scared to spend a single night in their new home. Maria was tormented by insomnia, likely caused by her recurring nightmares about a strange man stalking the children. The new home security system sometimes went off for no apparent reason, and Derek was now arming himself before checking on the property. Desperate and out of options, he even asked a priest to bless the house. Paranoia began to put a strain on Marie and Derek's marriage, and they began to view other neighbors with increasing suspicion. Maria tried to shield her children from the unfolding horror, but she realized she could no longer repress her own fears. She began to see a therapist who diagnosed her with post-traumatic stress, which would likely get worse unless they got rid of the house. But when they finally tried to sell, Derek and Maria hit another obstacle. 657 Boulevard had become notorious worldwide thanks to press coverage of the Westfield Watcher, scaring potential buyers away. Even today, the property remains unsold. Derek and Maria filed a civil suit against the Woods in 2015, citing severe and incalculable emotional distress and claiming the sellers failed to disclose prior knowledge of the mentally unbalanced stranger, leading the buyers into a dangerous, possibly lethal trap. The watcher had bizarrely claimed right of possession of the property. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy, one of the letters warned. What exactly did the watcher mean? Was the watcher really in control of the house, or was it the other way around? 
Regardless, the lawsuit stated the family would not be safe on the premises until the watcher could be identified and stopped. According to an interview in New York Magazine, Derek and Marie received one final letter in 2017. It was short, simple, and chilling. Loved ones suddenly die, it said. You are despised by the house, and the watcher won. In a way, that may be true. In recent years, the story of the Westfield Watcher has surpassed even the Jersey Devil as the most talked about and infamous legend in the state, and the Broadus family's story has made headlines worldwide. Netflix is reportedly closing a seven-figure deal for the film rights to the story. Meanwhile, the terrifying mystery of the Westfield Watcher remains unsolved. If you have information that may help uncover the Watcher's true identity, contact us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. There are two good reasons why certain reports of ghosts, hauntings, and other paranormal phenomena catch fire on social media more than others. To begin with, it's tricky to convince the world you've seen a ghost, but when you've supposedly got evidence to back up your claims, the story suddenly becomes a lot scarier. And if you've also got a way with words, like New York-based artist, writer, and former BuzzFeed contributor Adam Ellis, you just might trigger a worldwide epidemic of the creeps. That's exactly what happened when Ellis began a Twitter thread on August 7th, 2017, with this simple but chilling entry. My apartment is currently being haunted by the ghost of a dead child, and he's trying to kill me. So began a nightmarish journey, unfolding in real time, as Ellis began documenting each new encounter with the nocturnal visitor. Ellis first believed the dead boy sitting in a rocking chair at the foot of his bed was a product of his sleep paralysis. But the encounter was vivid enough to wake him screaming in terror, and he remembered exactly how the child looked when it began to walk toward him. Ellis tweeted a sketch of the boy, showing a huge dent in the right side of his skull. He went on to describe a second dream in which a mysterious woman told him the ghost would answer two questions if you addressed him as, Dear David, but the woman also issued a grim warning. Never try to ask him a third question, or he'll kill you. It wasn't long before Ellis had chosen his questions. The first, Dear David, how did you die, was met with a mumbled response, an accident in a store. Ellis moved on to question number two. Dear David, what happened in the store? A shelf was pushed on my head, the boy answered in the same guttural groan. That's when things took a darker turn. Ellis accidentally asked a third question, failing to realize his mistake until it was too late. Who pushed the shelf, he asked. There was no reply. Fearing for his life, Ellis desperately began searching for information about the boy and his alleged death, but he couldn't find a trace of information. When the unit above him became vacant, Ellis decided to move there, hoping the ghost was somehow connected to his original apartment. A couple of months passed without incident, but eventually, strange and troubling events started up again. Ellis's cats began to behave erratically every night after midnight. When they became fixated on something outside his front door, he checked the peephole and swore he could see something on the stairs outside. David found me, he finally tweeted. After that, Ellis tried to gather more evidence of the tiny specter, setting an audio app to begin recording any time a new sound was detected. Most recordings led to nothing, 
But then there's this one, captured between 2 and 3 a.m. That strange electrical tone can be heard beneath what sounds like tiny footsteps. Then the sound of Ellis reacting to something in his sleep. Then the first visual evidence emerged. It began as a series of Polaroids. The photos came out normal until Ellis tried to take a picture of the stairway where he first saw the movement. Every time he tried, the area exposed as solid black. Each passing day brought a new horror and Ellis was scared for his life again, just as the first physical evidence surfaced. After a dream in which David was dragging him by the arm, Ellis awakened with a bruise in the same spot. Then the phone calls began, dozens of them, always from an unidentified number, always at night. When he finally answered, there was no reply until he was about to hang up. Then came a whispered voice, a child's voice saying, hello. It was only a matter of time before video began to surface on the thread, thanks to an automated nanny cam that Ellis installed. It was uneventful at first, until the cats began reacting strangely to something the camera couldn't see. Then one of the motion alerts triggered the following video. Keep your eye on the green chair. In part one of this case, we began our investigation into Dear David, the infamous Twitter tale of Adam Ellis and his series of encounters with a little boy's ghost. We ended with this footage from a motion-triggered nanny cam Ellis had installed in his apartment. Keep an eye on the green rocking chair. By now, Ellis was feeling unsafe no matter where he went, including a trip to Japan where he spotted this terrifying detail on a park monument a dead ringer for David. After his return home, that same face seemed to appear at the peephole. When the dreams came back, Ellis was convinced it was only a matter of time before he met his doom. Yet he continued to take pictures. If David is going to kill me, he tweeted, maybe I can at least get evidence on my phone. And that's exactly what he got. This photo, with the brightness enhanced, clearly reveals a small child whose head is grotesquely dented on the right side. But Ellis's ordeal had only just begun. He was now hearing strange noises coming from just above the ceiling. Until now, he had believed this small hatch in the hallway led to the roof of his building. But on closer examination, there was about three feet of space between the door and the rooftop. Using a long pole, Ellis nudged the hatch open and something dropped out of it, a child's leather shoe. The only other object in the crawl space was a small green marble. The bizarre occurrences eased off for a while, but it wasn't long before a sense of dread began to overwhelm him, and that's when David returned. This series of photos show the same child apparently looking at the ceiling, then disappearing, then reappearing closer to Ellis's bed. He appears, vanishes, then reappears, closer and closer each time, and then he's gone. He sensed that David would follow him wherever he went, while visiting family in Montana for the holidays, he was awakened one night to see a vague shape moving in the darkness. The next morning, he saw this set of tiny footprints in the snow, tracks left by a child's shoes. When he returned to New York, the dreams intensified, 
culminating in a nightmare in which David was floating near the ceiling before dropping on top of him. He awakened in terror, feeling a crushing weight on his chest, but saw nothing at first. Then he took this picture. As time wore on, the incidents tapered off and eventually seemed to stop. But David apparently wasn't about to leave Ellis alone for good. This selfie he took earlier this year seemed ordinary enough at first, until it appeared in his Instagram story. Ellis's features are horrifically distorted in this image. Just a glitch? Maybe. Ellis eventually stopped updating the thread, but the story continued to gain momentum until it seemed the entire world was haunted by the malicious ghost child. Even now, Ellis continues to receive angry emails from parents, accusing him of giving their children nightmares. It was only a matter of time before Hollywood came knocking. As of November 2018, Ellis's story has reportedly been optioned by producer Dan Lin for New Line Cinema. But no high-concept horror film could be as terrifying as Ellis's own personal account of the ordeal. And it's only a matter of time before Dear David reveals himself again. If you have any information that might shed a light on the mystery of Ellis's ominous visitor, share it with us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. It began in 1946 in the quiet town of Texarkana, Texas, a string of brutal, horrific killings that made headlines across the United States and beyond. Originally coined the Texarkana Moonlight Murders, the crimes committed by this unknown assailant still haunt the world today, especially thanks to two movies bearing the same ominous title, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. We'll discuss those movies in a moment. But first, let's go back to that fateful year and examine the real-life horrors that inspired them. Around midnight on February 22, 1946, Jimmy Hollis and his girlfriend, Mary Jean Luray, were sharing a private moment at a popular lover's lane on the outskirts of town. That's when they encountered a tall stranger, his face hidden by a white hood. What happened next was described by police as an armed robbery that took a more violent turn. Though both victims survived, Jimmy was severely beaten and Mary Jean was violently molested. Police spent the next month searching for the perpetrator, but turned up no clues. Then, on March 24th, he struck again. This time, there were no survivors. Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore had chosen their own secluded parking spot near the railroad tracks when the masked man attacked. But this time, their car was spotted by a passing motorist. When he pulled over, he discovered the aftermath of a gruesome double murder. Griffin and Moore had been shot in the back of the head. Blood tracks suggested the woman's body had been dragged outside the car. Police had established the killer's M.O., and the investigation expanded to a full-scale manhunt. A reward was posted, and several suspects were questioned, but still no conclusive evidence was found. It wasn't long before the next murders occurred, in the early hours of Sunday, April 14th. After playing saxophone with her band at a social event, teenager Betty Jo Booker got a ride home from her friend Paul Martin, but by sunrise, both of them were dead. This time, the details of the crime were different. Paul's body was discovered first on the side of the road, with multiple gunshots to the head, but the remains of Betty Jo were not at the same location. In fact, her body was found almost two miles away. At this point, police were convinced the citizens of Texarkana were being hunted by a killer with a distinct pattern. He struck every three or four weeks, always on weekends, and always at night. Then, on the night of May 3rd, the killer struck again. 
Virgil and Katie Starks were relaxing at home when gunshots shattered their living room window. Virgil was shot multiple times in the back of the head and two bullets struck Katie in the face. She was still conscious and managed to flee the house just as the killer climbed into the kitchen window. She ran to a neighbor's residence before finally collapsing from blood loss. Katie survived, but unfortunately could not identify her husband's murderer. The only piece of evidence from the Starks attack was a flashlight apparently dropped by the killer. It bore no fingerprints. No one knew who it might have belonged to. By now, the town was in a state of panic. Curfews and roadblocks were set up, and residents began arming themselves, installing new locks and boarding up windows. Police patrolled day and night, and businesses closed early. By sunset, Texarkana became a ghost town. As rumor and suspicion spread, the unseen murderer had become a local boogeyman. Newspapers gave him different nicknames, but the one that stuck was the Phantom Killer. Then, all at once, the killing stopped. A month passed, then two, then three. No new crimes were reported. By the summer of 46, the investigation slowed to a crawl, and gradually the townspeople returned to some semblance of normal life. Among those closest to the investigation, the prime suspect is still a car thief named Ewell Swinney, whose wife made a statement linking him to the murders, but by law she could not be forced to testify against him. As a result, authorities were unable to convict Swinney, who neither confirmed nor denied his guilt. Filmmaker Charles B. Pierce began researching the details of the case for his 1976 film, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The movie hit theaters 30 years after the real crimes took place, terrifying audiences who had never even heard of the Phantom Killer. But the film also drew new attention to Texarkana. Controversy grew as the film opened wider, and relatives of the victims and investigators disputed the liberties the film took with the details of the case, leading the family of one victim to sue the filmmakers in 1978. This artistic license taken by Pierce resulted in the film's most notorious scene, Betty Jo Booker's saxophone was rewritten as a trombone, which the killer transforms into a bizarre weapon. The film also features one of the horror genre's first metafictional moments. In the final shot, we see the shoes of the unidentified killer, presumably standing in line for a ticket to the premiere. That formed the jumping off point for the sequel, in which a new killer begins reenacting the original murders. The Phantom Killer case remains unsolved. But if you have any information that might help identify one of history's most elusive serial killers, email us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. At first glance, Stardust Ranch in Buckeye, Arizona looks like a peaceful plot of land, and its current residents, John and Joyce Edmonds, have lived there for over two decades. Their four-bedroom house, nestled within 10 acres of scenic Rainbow Valley, seems like the ideal home for baby boomers seeking a cozy escape from big city life. So why are they so desperate to get away from it? This is where it gets weird. You see, according to John Edmonds, the main problem is aliens the kind from outer space. John claims the ranch has been under constant assault by extraterrestrial invaders for years. He says the humanoid creatures are the same beings commonly referred to as greys by UFO enthusiasts. It's also a term used by reported victims of alien abduction, dating back to the testimonies of alleged UFO abductees Barney and Betty Hill in 1961. In fact, John claims the greys have repeatedly tried to abduct his wife forcing him to stockpile weapons in order to defend their home against the terrifying attacks. He also claims to have killed up to 18 of the extraterrestrial invaders, most of them with a samurai sword. 
He also claims the aliens have established a series of portals around the ranch, which he says might enable the beings to transport themselves instantaneously. John says he once saw his wife being lifted into one of these portals, surrounded by a mysterious cone of light, but was able to save her by firing on the source of the light with a machine gun. When Edmonds first announced he would be putting the ranch up for sale, his original asking price was $1.5 million, which already seemed a bit steep considering appraisers had quoted a much lower value on the property. But after John was featured on Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures in 2016, the asking price almost immediately shot up to $5 million. As of today, there are no legitimate takers, but the bizarre storm of rumors, theories, and publicity has continued to build over the years, and Edmonds has become a celebrity among UFO enthusiasts, granting numerous interviews for TV and the web. Naturally, there's been a large amount of skepticism in the wake of Edmonds' claims. Even hardcore UFO believers have been wishing for more visual evidence, especially images of alien corpses. John claims the lack of forensic evidence is due to the Grey's bodies instantly vanishing if you don't decapitate them and disconnect their antennae after they die. He says this solution has been too difficult to carry off in time to take photos or video afterwards. However, John has produced images of what he cites as bloodstains from one of these alleged kills. On other occasions, he has displayed strange wounds on his own body, which he claims were inflicted in one of his many battles with the Greys. A very different conspiracy theory once surfaced, claiming Edmonds invented the alien story to cover another, darker secret. This idea likely originated with an episode of The Unbelievable Podcast, featuring excerpts from the Ghost Adventures interview with John's wife, Joyce. The hosts went on to speculate that John concocted the alien story to conceal a case of real-life domestic abuse. Word of the podcast eventually got back to John himself, but he dismissed it, saying the host's opinions had no real legitimacy, and authorities have produced no evidence to support that theory. The audio of Joyce Edmonds also reveals she has never actually seen her would-be abductors, but she's told reporters she believes her husband's story, and without supporting evidence to the contrary, the podcaster's claim is unfounded. While Stardust Ranch remains on the market today, it appears the story of John and Joyce Edmonds is not over. Is John's story simply a hoax to spike the value of the property? It's hard to confirm, though he claims to have received multiple cash offers. Is he simply delusional or a true believer? If he's right, we'll need to see incontrovertible evidence. And if the alleged attacks continue, hopefully Edmonds will have a chance to provide that proof. As for now, we have no definite answers, and the case remains open. If you have any information that might help solve the bizarre mystery of Stardust Ranch, Contact us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. We've seen hundreds of blurry, shaky videos circulating throughout social media claiming to provide conclusive evidence of Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, or other paranormal phenomena, but most of them fall apart under closer scrutiny. Today's investigation, however, involves a handful of disturbing viral videos which still manage to defy explanation, or at least they've never been debunked by experts as hoaxes or misinterpretations of normal phenomena. The footage you're about to see depicts strange, often frightening creatures lurking in or near well-traveled areas, sometimes in plain view of passersby. This clip was first posted to YouTube in 2014 by Riona Kapoor. 
It begins with this couple posing in front of a historic landmark in Delhi, India, but it soon collapses into chaos as a strange figure is spotted flying overhead. As you can see, the shape hovers vertically for a moment before tilting into a horizontal dive and shooting across the sky. As onlookers and the camera operator react in horror, the figure emerges again, flying in the opposite direction at extreme speed. A closer look reveals the object is humanoid, with a head, arms, and legs. The next clip was documented by a traffic camera on Wessex Way in the UK in the early morning of November 14, 2007. After a semi-trailer passes on the northbound side, a large four-legged creature suddenly darts across all four lanes, nearly colliding with an oncoming vehicle before it leaps off the road and out of frame. As we zoom and enhance, it's still difficult to make out distinct features, but it's unlikely we're looking at a deer or other wild animal, as its body is too large. It does seem odd that the car at the lower right doesn't appear to slow down before it nearly collides with the creature, but this may be due to the thing's extreme speed. Our next find was reportedly uploaded by a user in the Philippines, who claims to have recorded this humanoid emerging from a small alcove within Echo Valley in Sagada. The footage takes place in daylight, and at least one bystander can be seen apparently running away from the hideous thing as it emerges from the shadows. The upload is in low resolution, which may have been intentional. In its current form, it's possible to figure as a rod puppet operated by someone inside the alcove, but we can rule out a costumed performer as the creature's forelimbs are much too thin for that. Our final clip not only remains unexplained, but is also one of the most disturbing, not only because of its realism, but because of the subject's close proximity to passers-by in a well-traveled section of Kiev in Ukraine. At first, it appears the figure scaling the underside of this bridge is human, and some users claim it's a trained rock climber who has performed and recorded similar stunts. But as the camera zooms in, we begin to see some distinct features that suggest the subject may not be human after all. When we enhance, it becomes apparent the limbs of this climber are unnaturally elongated. While hanging on with its front limbs, the climber's hind legs seem to swing above its head, like a monkey scaling a tree, or a bat gripping a cave ceiling. As of today, none of these videos have been fully explained, and if they are indeed elaborate hoaxes or stunts, the perpetrators have still not been identified. If you have any legitimate information which can help us prove or disprove the authenticity of this footage, contact us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. The story begins on June 6, 1992, in Springfield, Missouri. It was graduation night for Susie Streeter and her friend Stacy McCall. After a party, they headed to the house of their friend Janelle Kirby for a sleepover. That was to be followed the next day with a trip to a water park in Branson. Upon arriving, the girls saw the house was packed with guests, so they decided to leave, instead going to Susie's house to spend the night and meet up with their friends in the morning. They were seen leaving the party around 2 a.m. on June 7th. Once she was at Susie's house, Stacy called her mother to inform her of the change in plans. Cheryl Levitt returned home after her shift as a hairdresser. In the morning, Janice McCall, Stacy's mother, called the streeter Levitt home. After several failed attempts to reach them by phone, she drove to the house, where she found the girl's car in the driveway. She knocked, but there was no answer. The door was unlocked, so she entered. She found the house in its normal state, clean except for ashtrays full of cigarettes and three persons. One belonged to Susie, one to Stacy, and one to Cheryl. 
Nothing was missing from the purses, including Cheryl's cigarettes and a $900 paycheck from her shift at the salon. Friends of the three returned to clean up a broken porch light in the ashtrays, then waited for Cheryl, Susie, and Stacy to come back. The phone rang, and they let the answering machine pick up, whereupon an unknown male caller left a sexually explicit message. Inadvertently, that recording was erased. Janelle Kirby had received similar calls before, but investigators have not been able to connect them to this case. When police arrived at the house, they were furious to find the crime scene had been tampered with. Nevertheless, the investigation proceeded, and police discovered Susie had been scheduled to testify in court against her ex-boyfriend, Dusty Reckla. Dusty had been charged with felony vandalism for breaking into a mausoleum to steal a skull and bones. Other suspects included Stephen Garrison, who claimed a friend of his admitted to killing the women while drunk at a party. Garrison gave police information that had not been previously released to the public, which further supported his story. He also mentioned a green van driven by the alleged kidnapper. The police carried out three search warrants based on this information, but failed to find anything of interest. Garrison himself would later be sentenced to prison for rape, sodomy, and harassment of a female college student. Another suspect, Robert Cox, was a former army ranger who currently worked with Stacy's father. In 1997, Cox told police he knew the women were dead. His girlfriend said he was with her at church at the time of the girl's disappearance. But after Cox was arrested for armed robbery, she admitted to making up this alibi and claimed not to know where he was when the Springfield Three went missing. Cox then toyed with the police, saying he'd tell them what really happened, but only after his elderly mother had passed away. In a 1992 episode of America's Most Wanted, an unknown caller claimed to have prime knowledge of the abductions. But when the operator transferred the call to police, they hung up and never called back. In 2017, Springfield reporter Kathy Baird began investigating the case herself, based on a tip suggesting the women were buried in the concrete of a hospital parking lot, which had been poured the year after the women disappeared. Baird went to the police with this information, but it was dismissed for two reasons. First, the parking lot would not have been installed without prior ground excavation, and second, the reporter claimed to have received her information from a psychic. Baird still maintains she knows the abductor's identity and the location of the victims, but she's reluctant to speak out as she also claims to have received threats from a person or persons unknown, demanding that she leave the matter alone. So what really happened to the Springfield Three? If you have any information which might shed new light on the case, Email us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous. When it comes to unexplained incidents, urban legends, and online horror stories, the subject of video games seems to spring up again and again. Social media is overflowing with stories like these. More bizarre examples include an urban legend commonly known as Ben Drowned, which involves an NES cartridge allegedly haunted by its former owner. And there are more recent tales of online games like Sad Satan, a deep web app capable of infiltrating the player's computer and mining private information about their life, or worse. Paranormal forums are overflowing with tales of secret game levels containing the power to possess or control your mind. And of course, there are stories of video games that have literally killed their players. Most of these exist only as rumor and hearsay, but there's one chilling difference to this case. The details and the body count may actually be true. 
The history of the investigation goes back to the early 1980s, the golden era of the video arcade, and the birth of an urban legend that's still circulating today. Chances are you've heard the legend of Polybius, a cabinet game that many claim to have appeared at select arcades in the Pacific Northwest around 1981, only to be pulled immediately after reports of hallucinations, nausea, and other mental and physical effects on players. The Polybius legend became so widespread it infiltrated every level of popular culture. But this is not that story, although it very likely inspired it. One of the most intense games in early 80s arcades was Berserk, a heart-pounding scenario challenging players to navigate mazes filled with deadly robots and a homicidal smiley face named Evil Otto. Those digital deaths became all too real for Peter Bukowski, age 18, and Jeff Daly, age 19. Apparently neither one knew the other, and the arcades where they played Berserk were thousands of miles apart. Daly reportedly died in Virginia, while Bukowski died in Calumet City, Illinois. Nevertheless, between the years 1981 and 82, both players, healthy teens with no known history of health problems, alcohol, or drug abuse, pushed themselves to their mental and physical limits to achieve the high score, and it may have cost both of them their lives. But that's not even the strangest part. Video game exhaustion is a very real and potentially fatal phenomenon, and reports of gamer deaths are not uncommon even today. But in the cases of Daly and Burkowski, the devil is in the details. Burkowski's demise occurred almost immediately after he finished playing. He even managed to enter his initials on the game's leaderboard before dropping dead. The coroner report listed cardiac arrest as the cause of death. The exact details of Daly's fate have proven more difficult to trace, with the only confirmed account citing the cause of death as a car accident. However, we do know the autopsy on Peter Burkowski revealed an unusual amount of scar tissue on his heart, but forensics determined the scarring was recent, possibly occurring over just two weeks. This led the experts to conclude that recent and extreme stress could have turned Peter's heart into a time bomb, primed to explode, and the notion of death by video game became a hot-button topic. Cardiologists have studied this effect in clinical tests, and their data supports the theory that games can literally kill. Game-related deaths are bizarre enough, but it's the scores on Berserk that prove to be the most unsettling detail in the deaths of Burkowski and Daly. Two gamers, separated by thousands of miles, died soon after achieving the exact same score, and according to some accounts, that score was 16,660 points. Both scores contained the sequential digits 666. Coincidence? Maybe. But it's unlikely we can prove or disprove any paranormal connection to these strange fatalities. There are other eerie details surrounding the Calumet City Arcade where Bukowski died. In 1988, a fight between two players turned fatal when one stabbed the other. Calumet City is also home to two water towers painted with the same yellow smiley face, an uncanny resemblance to Evil Otto. Over time, the details have blurred until they became the stuff of legend and lore, but some facts remain, and they still have authorities and health experts baffled almost four decades later. If you have any information that might shed more light on the untimely deaths of Jeff Daly and Peter Burkowski, send us an email at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept in mind. Criminal cases don't get much more disturbing than the bizarre and unexplained death of 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma, a case which remains unsolved nearly half a century later.
It began on August 7, 1972, in Springfield Township, New Jersey, when Jeanette told her parents she was going to visit a friend before work. It would be the last time they saw their daughter alive. When she failed to return, a report was filed with Springfield Police. Six weeks later, a dog came home to its owner with a gruesome trophy, a decomposed human arm. The dog's grisly find enabled police to locate and identify Jeanette's remains, which were found atop a cliff overlooking an abandoned quarry. Long before the incident, locals had given the cliff a suitably macabre nickname, the Devil's Teeth. This is where the details take an even more sinister turn, because witnesses at the site of De Palma's remains claimed the burial spot was surrounded by various strange objects, some of which appeared to have some connection to the occult. New testimonies began to circulate, claiming De Palma's body was not buried, but laid out on a crude altar, which sparked further rumors that she was the victim of a ritual sacrifice. Police deny these rumors, but nevertheless the case contains several inconsistent details, which magnified suspicions that Jeanette was killed in some kind of occult ceremony. That became more evident when reporters for the magazine Weird New Jersey visited Springfield to interview locals about the incident. They were met with cryptic replies and an unwillingness to discuss some details of the murder. The magazine claims nearly all the residents interviewed, including officials of the Springfield Police Department, insisted on speaking off the record, and several individuals who remembered the grisly details of the crime seemed afraid to talk about it, even many decades later. Police also claimed the bulk of the physical evidence and documentation pertaining to the De Palma case had been destroyed by Hurricane Floyd in 1999. Among all those interviewed, two aspects of the case came up again and again. First, a theory that the murder was some kind of ritual sacrifice by a satanic cult based in nearby Wachung Reservation. And second, that Springfield police had allegedly conspired to cover up the occult aspects of De Palma's death. If those accounts are factual, then who were the police conspiring with? Further questions arose following the publication of the Weird New Jersey article, and their editors claimed to have received multiple anonymous leads in the mail. They reported how all the leads arrived in plain white envelopes from all across New Jersey and bearing no return addresses. The magazine then posted the most unsettling of these alleged leads. One letter mentioned rumors of a satanic cult in the area known simply as the Witches, who planned to kill a child on or about Halloween, either by kidnapping and sacrificing them or by poison. Another disturbing account came from an alleged relative of one of the officers assigned to the case, recounting that the search party found arrows carved in the trees that led in the direction of De Palma's body. They also described gruesome details of the crime scene, which they claimed were known only to the police, including a bizarre arrangement of dead animals around Jeanette's corpse. They also claimed the reservation had been a gathering place for devil worshippers for many years. Other research into the case found a possible connection to New Jersey mass murderer John List, who shot and killed his mother, then his wife and three children, on November 9, 1971 in Westfield, New Jersey, one year before De Palma's body was found. Then he disappeared for 18 years before being identified on an episode of America's Most Wanted. Over the decades, the case has grown to mythical proportions, and Weird New Jersey revisited the story on multiple occasions. They compiled so much information that co-founder Mark Moran and correspondent Jesse Pollack decided to compile their collective research into the 2015 book Death on the Devil's Teeth. Despite this exhaustive research, there are still no definitive answers to the mystery of Jeanette De Palma's bizarre death. Perhaps we'll never know who is responsible, but the answer is out there somewhere, and maybe you can help. If you or someone you know has legitimate information, testimony, or evidence about this case which investigators and reporters may have overlooked, be sure to contact us at theunsolved at dreadcentral.com. All sources will be kept anonymous.